uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm, um, I'm Ed Wilson. I'm the uh, Microsoft scripting guy. Thank you. I was just going to say. And I write a blog every day that's called like, Hey, Scripting Guy. Um, and it's uh, probably got more information about PowerShell than any other place on the internet, you know, just to be honest. Um, last year, I, pu I publish stuff generally on it twice a day, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so last year, I um, published about 450,000 pages of information onto the blog. So that's the equivalent of about three books, uh, the size of my uh, PowerShell step-by-step -step book. And um, so that's, that's cool. And I've actually been doing that for five or six or seven years, I guess now. Can't remember exactly. And uh, so then I needed another challenge. And uh, so they, uh, they moved me to the OMS team, the Operations Management uh, Suite team. How many of you guys know about OMS, by the way? Uh, just a few. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're going to change that. Um, OMS, you can kind of think of it as like, um, like systems management suite for the cloud, you know, in one respect. Um, but, yeah, we're doing, uh, this is a, it's a really, really, really dynamic team, really cool. And... Um, I kind of make jokes a little bit and say that um, you know, my boss, Jeremy Winter, is kind of like the Jeffrey Snover of the uh, management space. You know, um, of course, you know, maybe in another year or two, they'll be saying that Jeffrey Snover is kind of like the Jeremy Winter <laughs> uh, guy. Um, but uh, but say it's a really, really cool, a very, very dynamic team. And they brought me over specifically because of all of the stuff that I'd done with community and with blogging and social media and all of that for PowerShell, you know, and they want me to do it, you know, also in the, uh, the OMS space. Uh, the really cool thing about this team is that they kind of, they didn't want to just, like, pull me over and have me just do OMS, you know, because they kind of see a value, you know, in the scripting guy as a brand. And so, so, um, so even though my boss doesn't like really own PowerShell or really even have that much to do with PowerShell, you know, he's, he's continuing to fund my, um, you know, my PowerShell proclivities, so to speak. Because <laughs> uh, that, that, that would have been a deal breaker, you know. Um, you know, when, he, when I was talking with him, you know, if he'd said, well, you know, you can't do PowerShell anymore, I said, well, you yeah. know. Yeah, so long, farewell. <laughs> uh, but uh, the really cool thing is, you know, the more I know about OMS, I mean, you know, we do a lot of stuff with PowerShell, you know, under the covers. You know, and so for me, it became just like a very, very natural, you know, next progression. You know, so if you think about it, you know, I've been doing, doing IT stuff for a long time, you know, um, yeah, and in the old days, you know, if you wanted a program to do something, when I first started out, you had to write your own program to do it. You know, and then you started kind of sharing your programs and stuff. So there really wasn't a role of admin, you know, that wasn't also basically a developer. You know, that's why in the old days when you went to, went to university and you got a degree in computer science, you know, you learned programming. You know, and then along this way, you also learn systems as well because, you know, there wasn't this dichotomy. You know, and then it wasn't really until the Windows world kind of came in. Well, maybe network kind of started some of it, you know, where it kind of started splitting stuff up a little bit more into ops and then more into dev, you know. Um, but, um, you know, still, I mean, you know, if you were going to manage, you know, hundreds or thousands of systems, you know, you had to learn how to write code, you know, whether it was Perl, whether it was VB script, you know, or what have you, you know, you were going to be learning some kind of code. You, you certainly couldn't do it with, you know, just patch files. <laughs> I mean, yeah, although I have seen some extremely impressive thousand line long batch files. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, some of the stuff that we actually did with batch files. Yeah. Um, Matter of fact, at Microsoft, we had a, a batch file. I think it was about 10,000 lines long. It was called Razzle. And I think Bill Gates was one of the people that wrote, like, the first version of it. And it's, uh, for until a few years ago, that was the program that we used to build Windows. 
Yeah, um, and you know, obviously it got added on to and added on to and added on to as Windows became much more complex. So I was, it was really, really cool. Back in the PowerShell 2, I think, time frame, uh, we had enough in the world of PowerShell that we decided to convert Razzle from Razzle dot, you know, uh, BAT to Razzle dot PS1. You know, so we converted it into PowerShell, and that dramatically trimmed that down a lot. Um, so, um, so anyway, so um, so uh, OMS does a lot of PowerShell, and uh, so this is my blog, uh, Microsoft.com slash MSOMS. Uh, I'm writing it basically five days a week, and uh, I'll probably expand the pace and the rhythm on that. Um, so from those of you that raised your hands that said that you have uh, that you know about OMS, if you would like to. Um, write a guest blog for this. You know, this is a really good chance to get in on the ground floor. Um, I have had one guest blog article so far. Uh, so so this, is, uh, this is your chance to, to make a big impact. So uh, if you do want to do that, you know, shoot me an email um, and uh, make sure that you mention, you know, that, uh, that you were here in this user group. Um, So that's my real email address. Don't go writing it in bathroom walls and, and bars and stuff. <laughs> yeah, for a good time, email the scripting guy. <laughs> so uh, so edwils at Microsoft.com. Uh, so shoot me an email if you'd like to uh, write a guest blog article. As a matter of fact, I'll extend that to anybody, uh, to either of you. So if you want to write about PowerShell for the PowerShell blog uh, or about OMS you know, for the OMS blog, you know, um, please you know, shoot me an email on that. Okay, um, and that is actually, could be very, 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 very good for your career, by the way. Uh, I know more than one person, you know, that, uh, that told me, you know, that uh, when they went in on a job interview, you know, that they, uh, you know, on their resume, they said, you know, I wrote a, wrote a guest blog for the Hey Scripting Guy blog, and the guy that read that said, you wrote the script for the scripting guys? Yeah, man, I read that blog every day. <laughs> yeah, and they got hired. You know, I'm not sure that that was the only reason they got hired, but, you know, and, but it, it didn't hurt, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so, um, so that's something that, that I do that's really, really unique you know, in the world of Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft has more than 20,000 blogs out there. Um, not that many of them, you know, solicit content, you know, from people in the community. So, um, anyway. All right, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about PowerShell today, and um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about data grooming. Now, um, how many of you are SQL admins? Cool. All right, that's good. So this is a perfect audience for, uh, for a data grooming talk. Um, there you go. Huh? What are you talking about, man? Yeah. All right, so... Let me ask you this. How many of you are admins? You do admin kinds of things. Okay. And the rest of you just came in for the free pizza, right? <laughs> that, that happens sometimes, you know. Um, there's a guy in New York, you know, that, uh, that like every user group, you know, he's right there. It doesn't matter what the subject is. I mean, he's right there, you know. So, yeah. uh, I mean, he probably knows more about computers than anybody that works there uh, by now. I mean, you know, from sitting in all his user group meetings. Uh, but anyway, um, so what, what am I saying about data grooming? You know, we, well, we've all heard the phrase... You know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Okay. So uh, Active Directory is a database. Office 365 uses a database. SharePoint uses databases. Okay. Everything uses databases. I was talking with a guy uh, before the meeting, and he was talking about, you know, uh, security, ACLs, and you may have heard part of my discussion. Um, guess what? Our file system can be construed as a database. And at one point in time, you know, there were some very serious discussions about getting rid of NTFS and replacing it with SQL. We certainly would not be the first operating system that actually used a database for our file system. You know, uh, it has to actually has some very interesting you know, possibilities. Yeah. DNS. 
DHCP, WINS, all of those are databases. Okay, so as admins, we deal with databases whether we know it or not, whether we want to or not, and so the number one database rule, garbage in equals garbage out, definitely applies. Okay, so I'm going to, um, to go over a, um, so, so what this is, is I'm going to talk basically, you know, about cleaning up some data that we would use for Active Directory. Okay, uh, and uh, so, um, you know, kind of bear with me a little bit here because I'm, my monitor didn't mirror, <laughs> and so I'm like having to look over here while I'm working over here, you know, so um, it's not, I um, hope I don't have a crick neck at the end of the thing. So anyway, so uh, I want to show you this. Okay, so this is a, a typical CSV file that we might get that we're going to use to create us some uh, users in Active Directory. Now, to set the scope for this talk, I'm not going to talk about how I got the CSV file. I mean, it's like, dude, you could do it in ADUC, Active Directory using computers, right? Click, export to CSV. I mean, how hard is that? You know, so uh, I'm not going to demo that. You know, um, I'm not going to talk about bringing the data back into Active Directory. Dude, there's lots of ways of doing that. I mean, I can use add user. I mean, how hard is that? Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is this seriously screwed up CSV file. <laughs> so take a look at it. So we got name. And then we, uh, so now my top row is obviously these are my columns. So we got name. And then we got day, month, year. OK? Now, Back around Y2K, I don't know if any of you are actually old enough to have been in IT operations at the year, at the turn of the millennium. <coughs> Certainly you weren't, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you may have heard of it, you know, in elementary school or something, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, kindergarten, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, you know, uh, those old databases, the whole thing was, there was, those databases were text-oriented. They were not object-oriented databases. So there was no concept of a date-time object. So you actually had a field that was the day field, you had a month field, and you had a year field. And well, guess what? The year field was two digits long, just like the day field and the month field. Okay? So that was the problem. So uh, if you were ever in a situation where you were going to try to export data from this one database and bring it over into, say, a SQL database, SQL uses a date time object for the date timestamp. Okay? So you had to combine those three fields and make a system date time object. Okay, Active Directory uses a system daytime object over there. You know, uh, in fact, everything in the Windows world uses a daytime object. You know, we don't use, you know, individual fields for day, month, year, you know, minute, hour, second, and all that junk. Uh, so one of the things I could tell right now is I'm going to need to group these three things here and turn them into some kind of an object. Okay, now I've got an address. Okay? Just address. But underneath the address, we've got street address, we've got the city, we've got the state, and we've got a zip code. Now, if we look on through this a little bit, we can see that we actually have other issues or problems. So that my street here is abbreviated, ST. Here it's abbreviated, ST, all caps. Here it's spelled out, street in lowercase. Here, it's spelled out street properly. Okay, initial case. Um, here I've got abbreviations. Here I don't have an abbreviation. Here I've got a period after an abbreviation. There I don't. Here I've got a comma between my, um, my zip code, and there I don't. And here I've got somebody that maybe had a stuck key when they were typing in the zip code. Okay, so um, the names are the same thing. I've got Adam Adams, then I've got Boop, comma, Betty. 
and then Sidney Crawdad. Yeah, so I've got lowercase names, proper case names, first name, last name, last name, first name, you know, and then just other stuff. Okay, this is actually kind of typical when you let users type in and, or input data into your database without doing any kind of constraints or checking, you're going to get what they give you. So that's the garbage in part. Now, obviously, what we would like to do is to fix stuff up properly, you know, so that we don't get into this kind of a situation again. But in the meantime, we can fix it. But I'm just kind of showing you the type of data that we have. Yeah, and this is actually pretty bad data. I mean, you might think, well, dude, no, you wouldn't really see something like this, but I could tell you, yeah, you would. Um, so we could tell that I need to fix the date. I also need to fix the usernames. Yeah, and then I need to fix the addresses. So there are three separate tasks that I need to do. So the best thing uh, is that I want to, um, yeah, I want to be able to, first of all, import this data, take a look at it, and see what it looks like. Now, one of the things that PowerShell does very, very well is work with this text. Yeah, and it makes data grooming, such as we have here, very, very, very easy. So a lot of database administrators, for instance, like to use PowerShell you know, to clean up their data before they actually put it into a database. So they get a data dump from somewhere, they can easily parse through it and fix it, or fix it to a certain level of consistency you know, before they ever bother putting it into the database. So the way that we do this is we use the import CSV commandlet. So um, I just specify import CSV, give it the path to where my CSV file retains. I'm going to store it in a variable called data in, and then I'm just going to read data in and uh, see what it looks like. So when I do, notice that I have now converted this CSV file into an object. And so my properties are name, day, month, year, and address. And so we can kind of scroll through this and look at it and see, you know, um, these different pieces. Now, if I, and I said it's an object, so I can uh, use get member. And we can see that each of these uh, is showing up as a note property on my object. Okay? Now, I can even look at individual records by indexing you know, into it. So I use a square bracket and a number, and this will allow me to work with an individual record or an individual object from this. And so we can see that there's Boop, comma, Betty. So that's her name. And then this. So what this tells me, I always like to, to do this. Because if I can index directly into my collection, and if I can look at an individual record, then it is very easy for me to be able to iterate through the entire collection and also have the same properties available to work with. So we could think for each next, you know, or for next loop, we could think, you know, for i is equal to 1 to however many objects I have in my collection. All of those things are uh, do while, do until. All of these are constructs that I can use that are going to allow me to walk through my collection and to work with individual records. Um, I made up a word that I like to use, and um, you know, within this collection, what I call this is singularization. Like I said, I made it up. Yeah, but this is a single record from this collection. And so if I can get a hold of a single record from this collection, then that means that I can work with all of the records in the collection by using one of those looping techniques. There's not any magic here. Any comments or questions? Snide remarks? Yes, snide remarks. If you put a zero in there, will that pull the first record? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That is absolutely correct. So this is a computer. Uh, now, this, this is a really, 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 so I'll do my spice scares. Really, 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 Okay. So this is a really, really good question here. Okay. Now, in VB script, our arrays would begin at either 0 or 1. And so we had to use what was called U-bound, no, I'm sorry, L-bound, lower boundary 
of the array to find out if my array was a one-based array or a zero-based array. In PowerShell, we said, dude, who came up with that crap? Yeah. And so all of our arrays begin at zero, just like most normal programming languages do. Even in Europe, uh, all of their elevators, they do PowerShell. Because <laughs> the first floor, it's zero. It's zero-based. So, yeah, it's only over here that, you know, it could be zero or one for the first floor. You know, so, so over here, our elevators are VB script. In Europe, they're PowerShell. Yeah. <laughs> and don't ask me if I've ever gotten lost in an elevator because actually... The question is, answer is yes. I have been lost in an elevator. <laughs> All right, so I told you that there were many ways that I could walk through my collection, right? Well, so here uh, I read in my, uh, my, uh, my objects, or I create my objects from my CSV file. They're stored in a variable called data in. And now I use for each to walk through it. Now, if I say for each, then I have to have something you know, um, in my hand to let me know what that singularized object is out of my collection. So I just generally like to use like a single letter for that singularized object. And here I use D because I called it data in. If I called it collection of objects, then I might have used C instead of D. So, you know, I kind of like to use the first letter of my variable that holds the collection. That way it's going to make it easier for me to read, debug, and understand my code should it ever come to that. Okay? So, just kind of a trick. So, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to create a custom object. You can tell. One of the things that's nice about Windows PowerShell is that I can generally read it. Okay? So, PS custom object, hmm, what do you think that is? That's a custom object in PowerShell. PS stands for PS. Yeah. It's not psst, custom object. You know, it's, it's a PowerShell custom object. Okay. So, psst. All right. So, all right. so uh, I'm, now this is actually, uh, uh, I call this casting. Okay. And so when I say, uh, when I call it cast, you can call it whatever you want. I mean, you can call it, you know, potato chips if you wish. You know, um, nobody would understand you, but that's fine. Yeah, um, but I call it casting, which means that I am going to cast what comes back from this into a custom object, where I'm going to convert what comes back to this into a custom object. Now, what am I going to do here? Well, dude, I'm going to take number, 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 and turn it into what? A date time object. So I'm going to cast that string, or actually, in this case, three numbers. I'm going to cast that into a date-time object. Now, for those of you who are, are program-minded, then I'll tell you this. Windows PowerShell is a strongly typed language that uses an automatic type conversion system so that it can behave as if it were a not a strongly typed language. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. You know, that was just a public service announcement for developer-oriented people. Okay? Otherwise, just ignore it. Okay. So what it means is that I could take a number and turn it into a date-time object without any hassle. Okay? So PowerShell is going to look at it as long as I can make something that kind of looks like a date, it'll accept it, and it'll act like it's a date. Okay? It's very, very, very sophisticated. So, what am I doing here? Well, this is called a format specifier, and so I have three numbers, day, month, and year, month, day, year, whatever, and I'm wanting to format them, that's what the dash L means, I'm wanting to format them as number slash number slash number. <coughs> that kind of looks like a date, doesn't it? So I'm turning it into a date. I'm saying, take this and plug zero, because remember, everything starts at zero. So take month and plug it into the first position. 
take day and plug it into the second position and put a back swag or a forward swag, depending on whether you're standing on your head or not, yeah, in between here. <coughs> and then take the year and put it in the third position. Okay? I love doing that. It's extremely powerful. It makes your code really easy to read once you figure out how to read it. Okay? <laughs> so let's run it, and what we should have now are dates. Sweet! Now, look at this. Everything's midnight, right? Why? Because it's a date time object. We don't have just a date object. So we get the time for free. <laughs> if we wanted to specify time over here, <coughs> then it would pick up time and it would make specific timestamps for us. Since we didn't, then it doesn't whine and say, dude, you must supply a time, because that would be a major pain in the butt. Okay? So instead, it just says, okay, midnight will be cool. And I say, cool, because I'm not going to use it anyway. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt anything. Okay, so that was our first problem. The first problem was fix the date. And we have shown that by now, by writing some very simple code, that we can fix the date. It's kind of like wax on, wax off. You know, paint the fence. Okay, so that was paint the fence. Okay, so now we're going to do wax on, wax off, maybe. All right, so um, la, 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 fix the date, fix the name. So now we're going to fix the name. Now, this is a little bit more code, isn't it? All right. So notice it all begins with the same part. Import the data dump CSV file, store it in a variable. Use for each D in data in. Exactly. So then now, I'm going to say if the name matches a comma. Now, that means if anywhere in the name field there appears a comma in any position, then I'm going to assume that my name is actually last name, comma, first name. Okay, so when we are doing data grooming, we have to arrive at business rules that we can utilize to govern how we're going to make our decisions. Okay, so this is not universal code, this is custom code that you and only you can make for your specific data import applications. But you can use this technique universally for any problem you may arise at. Okay. So if there is a comma, oh, dude, look at this. This is like one of my favorite lines of code. Um, it's cool, isn't it? All right. So how many of you have ever played with, like, Lego blocks in your entire life? All right, cool. Okay, uh, and the rest of you just use like cats and Velcro, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so um, what am I talking about? Here's a Lego block. Get culture. Okay, now you don't have to go to Vienna, you know, listen to Beethoven in order to get culture, although that would help. It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt a bit. Um, but get culture gets my culture settings. Now, my culture settings is actually a collection of settings that govern how text is, is displayed, how numbers are displayed, how dates are displayed, how money is displayed, all of that. My culture here is um, in U.S. English, more than likely. Get dash culture. Um, yep, U.S. English. Now, you've seen EN dash U.S. before. More than likely, you've also seen 1033 to four, before, depending on how deeply you have dove into Windows things. That stands for the code page, or code ID. Language code ID is what that stands for. Um, and that's 1033. Okay, that doesn't matter. Uh, but you can see that it is an object that comes back. So there is, on that object, a property called text info. Okay? Um, I can actually show you that. 
So I group this and I say text info. And then I go back to the beginning and I, I close this. And then now I come back with a text info object. Okay? So get culture. Dude, that looks exactly like what I typed right there, doesn't it? Get culture dot text info. Get culture dot text info. Okay? And if we look at this, we can see that there is, these are all properties, but there are methods as well. Okay? And I can show you those methods because I can pipe this to get member, get member, um, and then member type uh, method, and then say groovy groovy. And we can see that we come back with a number of methods on my system globalizations text info object. Clone. Send in the clones. All right, so, sorry. Um, get hash code. I won't even make a joke about that, particularly <coughs> since we're in the desert. Um, and then we have two string, two title case, and two upper. Two title case. Now, what do you think two title case does? It is a method. And it works with characters, strings, okay? And it is going to convert my string into what is called title case. So that's why the method to title case will convert whatever I give it into a title case. What is the title case? Well, the first letter is capitalized and everything else isn't. That's going to take care of that lowercase Betty Boop. Okay? Um, that's the easy way to do this. How, that's just going to let me fix the name yeah, and capitalize the first letter in each name. Well, then now I'm going to split it. When I split something, and I'm going to split it when I find a comma. So, boop, comma, Betty. Split the string in two, in this case. Now, when I split it, what do I have? I have an array of strings. The first element is zero, and the second element is one. See, I told you we'd do wax on. Wax on, wax off. Okay? So that is what we split does. And then what does trim do? You go to a barber, you sit down, and you say, just give me a light trim. Right? Okay, so we're going to trim our string uh, for split ends. Okay? Um, because we just split it, right? <laughs> so, uh, but we're also going to get split beginnings as well. What do I mean? Sometimes, it, depending on how something is typed, we may wind up with a leading space. Dude, those will cause you heartburn when you go to sort stuff out of your database. <laughs> Why? It's invisible. Leading spaces are invisible. Oh, no, Mr. Real. Yeah. So, well, that's why we have trim. It'll take care of those leading spaces, and it'll take care of those invisible trailing spaces too. In case it was boop, comma, or boop, comma, sp boop, space, comma, space, Betty. Okay? Those extra spaces would show up there at the beginning and the end of our strings, and they're going to seriously mess stuff up when we go to import it <coughs> and try to do sorts. So, Throwing trim on there doesn't hurt a thing. Okay? If there's nothing to trim, it won't delete letters. But if there's stuff to trim, it'll clean it up. So it's, a, it's really nice. It's kind of like a, a garbage tie that you put on your garbage bag. You know, I mean, you can tie the bag up anyway, but then just go ahead and put the tie on top of it afterwards. You know, it doesn't hurt anything, uh, really. So we already know how to create a custom object. First name, last name, zero, 01, blah, blah, blah. Or else, I don't need to title case it, um, and so I'm just going to split and trim. Okay, now I might need to title case it, but uh, just here I didn't. So if we find a comma, we're going to title case it because I know that there were examples where we didn't. Otherwise, I'm just simply going to split it and trim it, and we'll go first name, last name, blah, blah, blah. And so now I run this script. And sure enough, it works. So now we've got everybody is capitalized. First names and last names are in the proper place. 
and we should have no trailing nor leading spaces. Sweet, so that was the second thing. So we fixed the date, now we fixed the name. Notice I do this in descending order of complexity, you know, because that way it gets you moving into the project. <laughs> you know, helps you come over, overcome mental entropy. <laughs> yeah, it's like if it's just like you go dive into the address. Oh no, it's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be horrible. You know? So do something easy like just take the pieces and add them together and make the date. Uh, you, you, hey, I'm 50% done with my script. Of course, the last 50% is gonna be the killer part. <laughs> but you know, yeah, we count lines of code, not lines of uh, not level of difficulty. Sometimes. So uh, now we're going to fix the date. And like I said, it's a bit messy. Uh, same thing though, you know, I read the CSV file in, 4H, walk through it. Oh, come on, I'm wiggling my mouse. Dude. Well, so there's that, but the video is just gone on the monitor, so. Whatever. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so um, what I'm going to do, well, I'm gonna, first of all, I've got to split that address, you know, uh, because it wasn't in pieces. You know, we, we got street, you know, uh, city, you know, uh, state, zip code, none of that stuff was there, so I've got to split it. So I split that. And then, uh, so then I go into the first element, which was my street, and I know, and notice that I had three different types of streets. I had street, street, and ST, right? Yeah. So um, this is a regular expression. It's a very simple regular expression, but it's a regular expression nonetheless. <laughs> All right. So what this means is I'm looking for, this is my pattern, street or street. This bar right here in regular expression language means or. Okay? So I, notice I use single quotes. When you are, uh, afraid to move. Uh, when you are writing regular expressions, do not put your regular expression in double Quotes. That's the expanding quote. Now it will work 99 out of 100 times the way you intended. That one out of 100 times, you know, let's hope you're not suicidal that day, you know, because uh, it, it will be a booger bear to try to figure it out. Okay. So an ex uh, double quotes are expanding quotes. That means that PowerShell is going to expand variables. It's going to do stuff under the covers. It is not a literal pattern. And most of the time when you're doing a regular expression pattern, you want a literal pattern to be supplied to the regex engine. You don't want something that PowerShell thought you may have wished but didn't bother to type put into your regex pattern. <coughs> okay? So from a troubleshooting perspective, if you always make your regular expression patterns in single quotes, you'll simplify the equation. Okay, it's just a best practice. In fact, it's in my PowerShell best practices book, um, which I've got like several chapters in there on regex. Um, so then what I'm going to do then is I'm going to replace street or street with capital ST. Okay, uh, I could have added additional ORs. We'll just put the path in there and then, you know, Lane Avenue, you know, however, whatever your business rules end up being, so you can put them in there. Yeah, maybe capital S lowercase t if that had been in my source data and I decided that I was going to standardize uppercase st. Yeah, st period. Yeah, you know, if you want to, again, standardize on just capital st. Okay, so, um, so that, uh, so that's a decision. So I'm replacing here. Now in this <coughs> case, I'm matching. Um, so this is again is a regex match. The pattern is very simple. It's um, DWPT. Somebody thought it would be fun to abbreviate dew point DWPT. <laughs> Just like they could have abbreviated Charlotte CLT. It's a common abbreviation. 
It's a whole lot easier than trying to remember if Charlotte has one L or two. <laughs> you know? um, but anyway, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, so I'm matching that, and if it's there, then I'm going to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to do something else. You know, um, same thing here. If it's um, if it's South Carolina, then I want to match it, and then I'm going to replace it with SC. Otherwise, I'm just going to use what we've got. Uh, the zip code. Now, the zip code here could very well present a problem for you, because I'm assuming that if it's greater than five in length, it's a bogus zip code. So we're not doing zip plus three or zip plus four or whatever the heck that is. Also, I'm assuming, now I could have assumed that the first five numbers were correct and everything else was bogus. In that case, I could have just simply trimmed it to five and been done with it. But I decided that may not be the case, and so I thought I would just raise an error. And so I generate an error and say there's an error for the zip code. Now, if I wanted to be really, really cool, I could actually use a web service. Um, and I, I think I've written, some script, I've written a number of scripting guide blog articles about using web services. And I could have supplied the address to the web service and retrieved the actual zip code for that location that was in error and used what came back from the web service. On the other hand, it's not my data. You know, fix it yourself, <laughs> and I'm going to generate an error report. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, uh, but that, so there was, an, again, depending on what your business rules are, this is what you do when you detect that you have a problem with your data. Uh, so then I create a, a custom object. I'm going to uppercase the street and the city, so I use two upper. Now some of this, I threw some of these, uh, these various string methods in. Personally, I wouldn't necessarily do this. I'm showing you the variety of string methods that we have available, showing you different ways to handle a common problem. And then you could decide what meets, uh, meets your particular things. So if you wanted to use two title case, you've got an example in a previous grip where I used two title case. Then here, I'm uh, the state, I'm trimming it, using a substring up there, and then um, upper casing it, and then I'm zipping it out. And so when I run it, then um, we can see that this code comes, comes back. We've got our street, our city, our state, our zip code. We see that we have an error here and an error there, and everything else looks groovy, though it does look like we have a, um, a leading space in our data there that we would want to fix. Okay, so this is uh, how um, that would go. So now that was the third element of our problem. We had to fix the date, we had to fix the names, and we had to fix the address. So now that we have done that, we have code samples that solve each of our three use case scenarios. So now it's a simple matter of put all the code together and, um, and run it. Okay, so I'm going to create custom objects from my data. So I import CSV uh, for each D that's in my data. Now, one of the things in the ISC that we have are called regions. And this is a perfect place to implement regions. Okay, because I have three separate things that I'm wanting to do. So the name, if this is the exact name code that I had from my, uh, my script. So once I know that it's there and everything's groovy, I can collapse the region name. Now, the way that I implement a region, pound sign region space, the name of the region, and then the other keyword at the end is pound sign in region. Do not capitalize these. They have to be lowercase or it won't work. It's rather finicky. Okay, so then this is my address code. And uh, then this creates the custom object with my date time. I thought that since the date time code was pretty simple, I would just throw it right into the object right here rather than having a separate region to have to store and forward. And uh, so then that's there. So then when my regions collapsed, 
We could see 4HD, this blah, 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 <laughs> it, beginning script blocks, code blocks, and um, <sighs> come on. Yeah. Um, and, and then that's there. So then I can uh, just come over here and I can uh, run, uh, run the script, even with my regions collapsed. And um, so we can see that we have an object that comes back for each and every one of these individual users. Okay. Now at this point, I've just emitted my objects to the screen. Now I could pipe them into something else that would actually create users if I wanted to. Um, but so I have created the objects from my data. So now the next thing that I want to do is to <coughs> export those uh, objects into a CSV file. And uh, so then this then uh, is the same code that I had before. But notice that when I get to my custom object, I add this little bit of code. Export to CSV, specify my path, I append, and I don't have the types. So the types of the objects that are created uh, could be used for reconstitution of offline objects if I needed to do that um, from a CSV file. I don't need to recreate those objects. What I'm wanting is an actual CSV file itself. And so the type information shows up at the very top of the header, and it'll screw up my import. So the trick here is to make sure that I say no type information in my CSV file. And then when I do that, then I get this nice clean data that I have in this CSV file here. OK? So that's data grid. Any questions or comments? Um, it's, it's a bit of work, yeah, uh, these, uh, these scripts took me yeah, a couple hours to write, you know, might take you a couple days to write, <laughs> but, uh, uh, or a couple weeks, depending on your level, um, but what's valuable is the approach, okay, um, now, what I'm going to do, do a postscript to my presentation, and uh, so all that was theoretical, now, um, this is actually real. So I got an email uh, that came to Scripter. And, um, and what happened was this admin had been emailed a Word document. Okay? And they said, you need to create these users in Active Directory. Yeah. Um, <coughs> And as you, um, and, and this is pages and 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 pages of users. Yeah, um, each of which are helpfully. Um, yeah, yeah, it just keeps going, right? You know, um, each of which are helpfully identified by letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so we got columns and columns and columns. And columns, and um, and so the person had emailed this um, to me, and um, and said help. <laughs> <laughs> and and I will admit, you know, because because I used to be a net admin a long time ago, yeah, and I actually stormed around the house throwing stuff for about forty five minutes, <laughs> yeah. And um, I said, yeah, how in the world can they do this and abuse a poor dad admin like this? I mean, this is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And my first thought was email the list back with a spreadsheet and say, cut and paste this crap into a spreadsheet properly, and I'll be happy to create the users for you. And then, except that his second paragraph said, and my boss said, I can't email it back to them and have them fix it for me to just do it. <laughs> yeah, and in today's day and time, you know, you really don't need to be, you know, <laughs> making your boss too mad at you, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, and I start thinking, uh, oh gosh, you know, I mean, this is going to be a pain in the butt. You know, I mean, and I'm thinking, okay, word, you know, so I'm going to have to like, you know, you know, wrestle with the word automation model, which is a pain in the butt. Yeah, and I've got columns, you know, and this isn't even like a real table in here, you know. I mean, 
These are just columns. You know, see column? Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, and so like how, um, so I'm going to have to wrestle with creating a range and trying to go through this. You know, I was like, oh, this is going to be a pain in the butt. And then I got an idea. And I said, well, what if, you know, I just do like control C, you know, control A, control C, and I copy all of this to the clipboard and I paste it into notepad. Oh, yeah. No. Let's just see what happens, you know, um, yeah, if I put this into notepad. So I come over here and I paste it and lo and behold, notepad put it all in a single column. Yeah, and so now I've got rid of all of the word formatting. Yeah, and I got the word automation model out of the picture. Okay, so that sells a major headache right there. I mean, there goes at least 50 lines of code I don't have to write. Yeah, um, and this is text. Yeah, and I can use PowerShell to deal with plain text with get content. It's a one-liner. Okay? So this is starting to look up a little bit. Okay? And um, so, uh, so anyway, so uh, I, I uh, do that. And um, so then the next thing that I do is I, um, I then say, okay, remember, get content. Now, one of the things that I noticed when I was going through this is some of these names are international. So I've got Unicode to deal with. Okay? But luckily, Notepad, in newer versions, I didn't know this, you know, but Notepad does Unicode. Okay? So it's a little smarter than I thought. Yeah. And PowerShell handles Unicode no problem. I just specify encoding and everything's groovy. Yeah, in fact, I didn't even have to specify encoding because it detected Unicode in my text file and it imported it as Unicode anyway. Sweet. Okay, so that takes care of all those diacry uh, diacritic marks and stuff, you know. Um, so then for each, um, this should have been R in raw text, but yeah, anyway, I used N just for whatever reason. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because they're names. <laughs> <laughs> That's the logic. It was names. Uh, so uh, for each uh, name that's in my raw text, if the length is greater than two, why did I do that? Because of those helpful single letters A, B, C, D, and E. <laughs> okay? So once I've got it in a plain text file, then I can easily get rid of those helpful column heads. Okay? If the length is greater than two. Length is a property of a string. It's always there. Okay, uh, so then get culture, text file, uh, text info, two title case, name, split and trim, right? Okay, you recognize that from the other code. Create the custom object, last name, first name, zero, one. For each uh, name, um, match a blank. Okay, so there were no commas. These were all first name, space, last name. Kim space Anders. There was no Anders comma Kim. So how am I going to split first name and last name? They've all got a space. It's the final frontier. It's also my delimiter right here. Okay. Um, so then um, I split at the uh, at the space. Uh, so that's if it finds a space, then we're going to split it. Uh, then I create last name, first name. If there's another one, I use a middle name. Sometimes there was actually a third letter out there for a middle initial. Sometimes there wasn't. Yeah, so it was there, groovy, exported out, a pen, encoded as Unicode, remember, because I don't need, I don't want to lose those diacritic marks. Otherwise, uh, first name, last name, there is no middle initial. And then export it. Everything's groovy. What, excuse me. What about the ones that had like Timothy, like first name was Timothy space quote Tim in quote. 
Yeah, uh, that got uh, that, uh, So what happened then is I ran this several times, you know, um, and there are there are some outliers. Okay, so since we're dealing with like thousands of names here, um, I um, I didn't want to write uh, code for all of the edge cases. Okay, and so what I did is I kicked them out and then actually hand created those users. Okay, so um, to me, this particular code here, I, I stole it from my other scripts that I had written and that I had. Um, this script here took me 30 minutes to write. Uh, I spent more time complaining about you know, how the poor guy was being abused than actually solving the friggin' problem, you know, which is not necessarily a bad thing for your mental health to think about sometimes. You know, quit complaining, just do it. Yeah, um, and once I put my mind to the task, it was quite simple. But it seemed impossible at first glance. Or not impossible, but a major pain in the butt. Um, and uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, so, so this particular script does not get everything, but it gets like uh, 90, no, 90 percent, you know, of the, uh, of the problem. So now we've got the cleaned up usernames. And um, so then the next one, uh, come over here. And uh, <coughs> so uh, I'm not going to run this, but the, so this was the last task. Um, I imported the Active Directory module, get, uh, get AD object, data import, um, new AD organizational unit. So I created an organizational unit uh, just so that I could test my import. And I had to run it four or five times you know, to, uh, to add the extra cases, pick up the things that I was missing. You know, and then at the end, I said, well, I'll just hand create those users. Um, so um, you can't delete an OU very easily nowadays. Uh, so um, in order to make it easy to delete them, um, turn off protected from accidental deletion. So that's what that code does there. That way, because I wanted to just delete the OU after every time I ran the script. Yeah, um, so that I could make sure you know, that I was getting it proper. What does, so, what does the exclamation point that's a baseball bat, if not. Okay, so uh, get AD object. Uh, the filter, the name is equal to data import. So this means that uh, if I can't find it, then I'm not going to do it. So data import is the, um, the organizational unit right here. So if it does not find that OU, then we create the OU. So that's what this little bit of code right here does. Um, and then I, uh, I import, uh, import the names and go over here. Um, so um, and if I, I could add else and then delete the OU. Yeah, so that means if the OU exists, I'm going to delete it. If it's not there, I'm going to create it. You know, or I'm going to delete it and then create it. Yeah, so it's because, yeah, just to keep from running into name, name problems. And so then I come over here, I create the display name, the given name, the initials, the surname, same account name. Uh, this is the path. So all of these I create from the first and the last name. You know, that's what this does. Um, and then this is my error, pre my error handling here. So I'm going to uh, set my error, pref error action preference to stop. So if there's a problem, it will stop. And then it will try the user. It'll catch the error uh, and display the username, and then it will go to the next username. And so that's how I found the outliers that didn't, that didn't work, was uh, by using try catch finally. And so, so this is, like I said, this is a real world scenario here, um, and that uses exactly uh, the same you know, process, the same scripts, the same code uh, that I showed you earlier. Questions, comments? Okay, cool. So Jason's up. So go get Jason. Tell him he's uh, got to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.